Okay, so now we get to the proper presentation of the uh, of the network in terms of the service based nature of it. Now we are going to see here more or less all of the same functions, um, but presented in a slightly different uh, in a slightly different manner. But what we're showing you on the slide, first of all, are, are the parts of the network that really are not service based. So these are you know, this bottom part of the network, so connections into the access network and within the user plane, these are still presented, they have to be presented as the reference point architecture. So we will be talking about these interfaces quite a bit. We've already mentioned, for example, the N1 interface, which is the non-access stratum signaling interface. There is an N2 interface, which terminates at the G node B, and that's a NGC uh, interface. There is a user plane interface, a GTP based interface called N3, which connects the base station to the user plane function. The N6 interface is the one that connects to the external data network. And that is a roughly equivalent, shall we say, to the SGI interface that you might be familiar with from previous generations of network. And there are occasions where we might interconnect uh, or chain together multiple user plane functions. And if that's the case, they are interconnected using the N9 user plane interface. So the N4 interface, this is a just a control plane interface, but it is a reference point. It is not a sort of service based interface in that sense, but this is the packet forwarding control protocol, uh, which we use on that interface. So all of these are reference point interfaces. So let's reveal then the service based part of the network. Okay, we've got more or less the same things up there. So you see the, the AMF and the SMF and the UDM. So the functions are certainly present, but the manner in which they are connected now is somewhat different. So there's the dotted line, which appears to look like a bus. Okay, if you think of a data bus, uh, you know, like LAN networking or something like that, all of the network functions seem to be connected to all of the other network functions in some peculiar way. What it might be a good idea to do at some point is to look at this picture and the reference point architecture at the same time. You'll begin to see that, for example, uh, let's say the AMF and the UDM on the reference point picture, uh, well, they were interconnected on an interface uh, that we call the N8 interface. So you could maybe argue that what's actually going on here is that the AMF is connected somehow through that bus uh, like that. And then this particular relationship we would refer to as N8. Now the SMF is also connected to the UDM. Now that uh, is connected. Again, we'll just argue that it's going to go up and through the bus here. And that is connected on an N10 interface uh, and so forth. So you would be able to map the reference point architectures onto this particular picture, but that's kind of missing the point to a certain extent. Not least because we are using in this network, the way that information is exchanged between these network functions is very much like the internet. So internet servers or internet clients and internet servers will be exchanging information. So the way in which your web browser interacts with the web server, for example, is by and large on the basis of this HTTP2 method. So a hypertext transfer protocol is a very convenient and simple way of simply moving information around. A client can request from a server, a piece of information. So when you click a link in a web browser, we use HTTP and your web browser requests or sends a get message to the server. And then the server finds the content that you were referring to and then delivers it to your browser. And this is more or less what's going on. So if you imagine then that the AMF needs some subscriber information, then we can use a client server model, where in this case, the AMF is acting as client and the UDM will be acting as server. And we can make a request HTTP method into the network and just say, UDM, get me information about this subscriber. Uh, and then of course the UDM will then provision or service or serve that information back towards the AMF. You'll also notice then that each of these interfaces at least seem to have various names. So the NAMF, the NSMF and so on. So that effectively is the name of the service, which we would use to find and retrieve information and or services within this network. Now this will all become a little clearer when we start looking at examples of how all of this works, but maybe what we should do here is also draw a little network in which all of these things exist. This is a bit of a, but these are, these themselves are bits of software running in various bits of the data center. However, 
each of these interfaces or each of these network functions themselves are somehow addressed via IP. So that HTTP process, so again, think of the way in which your web browser works, you click on a link, okay, we get an HTTP request going off to a web server somewhere, but somewhere in the formulation of the message, we need to address the server. And then the server, when it produces the content, needs to then send that information back to a specific place. So we do have an IP-based network in here, at the very least, so we can route information between the different network functions, uh, albeit that they're all sitting in a data center as bits of software. And these names that we use here, so NSMF or NPCF, this is a piece of essential routing information that we would need to know. So if the AMF needs to route a piece of information to the UDM, then it will use the name. So we'll send a request. So this will be a request, okay, being sent to the N UDM. And then there'll be a complicated set of instructions and commands of what it is we exactly want to do. So that AMF can formulate the message, dump it into the network addressed to the NUDM. And then the routing processes in this network can just send it onto the bus, tootle it along the bus until eventually the information will kind of turn up here. I'm massively oversimplifying what's going on in that network, but nevertheless, adopting this mechanism, these HTTPs and such like, we need to have some form of addressing that we can use within the network. That's what these interface or, or network function naming conventions are all about. There are a couple of newer functions in here as well. I think we've seen all of those before. Well, there's three that we haven't talked about. Uh, one of them is the application function. Now that's fairly straightforward because we've seen that in previous generations of network. And the application function is quite often seen as just some external entity in relation to an application. The classic example of this, in fact, maybe the only example we've got of this is the IMS. So the IMS in its entirety would be seen as an application function in support of the voice calls and other things that you might do with IMS. But you could extend that description to practically anything. So you could have a video environment, you could have an industrial complex running a factory of robots, whatever that service is, it may be allowed to attach to the network in order to you know, deliver services to the mobile. Certainly when you look at the specifications, the application function, it is not assumed to be an internal part of the network. So this might not be yours, it could be a third party. It was always intended to potentially be a third party interface or a third party function, meaning that the connection from that environment into this environment is a, well, I'll put a question mark here because then there are all question marks about security. How do we know who they are? How do they know what we're going to do? How do we restrict the availability of service or information to that external application function? So this is basically some form of application-based API. Now, in some senses, to support the application function, certainly if they are um, external functions, we have this NEF process or function here, which is a network exposure function. Now, the network exposure function would be the thing that communicates with the application function. So the application function can talk to the network exposure function saying, uh, am I allowed into the network? If I'm allowed into the network, what things will I be allowed to do? And which parts of the network am I allowed to speak to? So the application function can get all of that information from the NEF. Now the NEF can communicate internally, so it can talk to the other functions of the network here and say, anybody know this application function? Does anybody know what they're allowed to do, who they should connect to? Uh, and so on. And at some point we can deliver a message back towards the application function that says, yes, everything's looking okay. I found you a bunch of functions that you're allowed to speak to. And we would then define the properties of this interface. So actually this API interface now would be allowed to be used. So there is a sort of a signaling connection across the top there that allows the application function to give it authority to enter the network. So the NEF network exposure function, the reason that we need such things as this in a 5G network is probably because the number of external networks that we will allow to be connected to our network will be very much greater than they are at the moment. Um, we, we're a bit careful about who we allow to connect to the network at the moment. NAAS. Now, you might have heard of SAAS, or Software as a Service, Platform as a Service, Infrastructure as a Service. Uh, well, how about Network as a Service? You know, because now we're in a data center these as a service things tend to be cloud related data center related services so if we have a network and somebody else needs a network well why couldn't we just expose our network services 
our network functions as a service to external third parties. You've got to think just how much work do you want to do as a network operator. If you're going to have like a thousand new commercial or enterprise clients, you're know, ranging from the port authority to the airport to Toyota uh, to an IoT firm, a smart building firm. How much do you, the operator, need to know about how to run an airport, for example? You probably don't want to know too much about it. But of course, the people that run the airport know exactly what they need to do. They know exactly what the communication requirements are of running such a facility. If you can describe through this API the, the basic capabilities that are available in your network, maybe in the context of a network slice, then you can expose just those network functions via these APIs to the airport authority. And then they're happy because they can see via the API all of the network functions that they need to run their service. And of course, the same will be true for any other type of third party that you may wish to interconnect to. So the plan for 5G is that you will have a lot more of these types of customers. The process by which we might expose the functions of the network to third parties needs to be somewhat optimized um, because we can certainly do it at the moment, but the administration and fulfillment process around that is, is quite time consuming and therefore not particularly optimal. So we need to be able to find an optimal way of doing this and automated processes via the NEF, the exposure function, is quite likely the way that we should go. And there is one final piece here. It's a repository function. So a network repository function. This is the library of all network functions within the network. Right? So you could see that as a list, right? So in there, there is a list of all of the currently active network functions. Think about this in terms of network slicing again. Every time we create a new network function, we will create a record of it in the NRF. So that any other function, for example, AMF, the AMF might want to know how to find certain network functions. So if it hasn't been individually registered for notifications itself, what well, the AMF or the NSSF or any of the other functions will do, is they will go and speak to the librarian at the NRF and say, I'm looking for a session management function that has these properties, that is able to do these things, can connect to these parts of the network. And then the librarian in the NRF will be able to look through its records and find out that either there is or there is not such a thing in the network uh, and report that back to the network function that was requesting the information. So every time a new network function is created, instantiated, uh, we will register its presence at the NRF and that information can be made available then to any of the other functions that might find that useful. So the NRF then is another one of these really important functions that allows the network to be dynamic, how many of the things you have and what the properties of all of the network functions might be in the network. It's probably not the best way to draw it, but again, I tend to just draw these like little multiple SMFs, multiple PCFs. It's a bit of a simplification, but one of these per network slice maybe, or multiples of these per network slice. Every time we create a new instances of these things, those will be registered in that library. And now we know how to go off and, uh, and, and find them. But these being bits of software, well, you can start them and stop them and scale them however you see fit, really, which is where this dynamic nature of the network comes from. Can the UE be supported by multiple slices at the same time? Uh, well, the answer is yes. Uh, now, we do that via so-called PDU sessions. So for every slice, there will be at least one separate PDU session. Now that PDU session uh, may or may not have a different IP address. It kind of depends what the terminating network is. A good example of this actually, uh, sort of, uh, here is the car of the future. But vehicles have a very complex series of communication requirements. So, I mean, think about it. There's what you're going to need. You're going to need a mobile broadband slice to support the Netflix in the back seat. You're going to need a network slice maybe to support real-time navigation information so that you, know, you can look at a map and drive the car. And then the vehicle manufacturer itself may want a network slice that uh, where you would have to have uh, connectivity with the engine management systems. Maybe you want to update the software for the engine management. Maybe you want to record driver statistics or behavior. And then, of course, you may have to have all of the advanced driver assistance connectivity functions, which might be you're know, taking over the steering if the driver falls asleep or has some medical issue, or maybe taking over the control systems of the vehicle in order to avoid a collision. So those are all 
a connection to a UE because the vehicle in its own, you know, it's in entirety would be considered as the UE in this case, but to support all of those individual services and to support them effectively, you would have to connect that single mobile entity to multiple network slices at the same time. And in those examples, each of the network slices and the services supported in those slices would likely have a different IP address because the IP address to let you watch Netflix on the internet is probably not going to be the same IP address to allow the vehicle manufacturer to fiddle with the engine management systems. Yeah, vehicles are complicated.